Here are some common questions I see asked on exams about that involve hemiacetals and acetals. So for one and two, predict the major product of these two reactions. For three and four, predict the reactant of these two products when treated with H+. And number five, the following structure can undergo two different intramolecular hemiacetal formations. Draw the two possible products. So if you want to try these on your own, go ahead and pause the video. Otherwise, let's start with number one. So for number one, the first thing to do is recognize what is your starting material's functional group. This right here is a carbon with an OH and an OR, meaning O carbon. And so what we know is that this is a hemiacetal. Now hemiacetals, can they react with NADH4? That's really the question. NADH4, if you've learned about your oxidizing and reducing agents, you've only seen NADH4 produce aldehydes and ketones, namely double bond O's. But there is not a single double bond O in this structure, so then how do we treat this with NADH4? Is the answer just no reaction? It's the same as what we started with? Not really. So here's how it works. Hemiacetals, what you need to know about them is that they are constantly fluctuating back and forth between their carbonyl form and their hemiacetal form. And how do we predict what that's going to look like if it's fluctuating back to its double bond O? The way you do that is you find your, acetal, your hemiacetal carbon, you erase the bond that connects that carbon to the oxygen that is part of the ring. And that oxygen that was part of the ring will become an OH. The other OH that was not part of the ring, that was sticking out, you're going to erase the hydrogen from it and make it a double bond O. This is what the hemiacetal will look like after you break apart the ring, after it, cycle, after it flips back to its carbonyl form. If you want to see a mechanism for how that happens, essentially what happens is this oxygen grabs a proton and becomes OH positive. This OH will then resonate down and break open the ring. And so you'd be left with double bond OH positive, this bond has broken and is now OH neutral. And then finally you deprotonate that double bond O so it becomes O neutral, double bond O neutral. So NADH4 as we know it cannot react with anything but double bond O's. And this is how we can turn a hemiacetal into its double bond O form. Then there's just a matter of well, what does NADH4 do to an aldehyde? It turns it into an OH. So the answer to this question is just that double bond O getting turned into an OH. Now, for number two, we're kind of in the same, a similar situation to what we were in for number one. Namely, we started off with a hemiacetal. But again, what do we have over the arrow this time? This is our Wittig reagent. This reagent, much like NADH4, only reacts with double bond O's. We don't have a double bond O, but we know that hemiacetals are constantly cycling back into double bond O's. So once again, what you'll do is find the carbon that is your hemiacetal carbon, erase the bond that connects the oxygen of the ring to that carbon, and make that former oxygen of the ring into an OH. The other OH that was sticking off of the ring will now become double bond O without its hydrogen. Okay? And if we react this with the Wittig reagent, the way we solve that is we're attaching this carbon to this carbon here by a double bond. And that double bond must always be the Z double bond, meaning it'll look cis in most cases. I shouldn't say Z equals cis, they're two different things, but most of the time we kind of make it that way. Um, so what I'm going to do is say, okay, this is one, two, three carbons. I erase my oxygen, one, two, three. So if I were to number these carbons, or if I were to number these carbons one, two, and three, coming off of the carbon that had the double bond O should be carbon one, because that's the carbon connected to the PPH3, two, three. And so my major product of this reaction would be OH, one, two, three, four, five, make sure this double bond is cis, and those two carbons there. So that's my major product there, okay? Predict the reactant. For these questions, you are given a structure, and the first thing you have to do is recognize what functional group is this structure. And what I see is, on one carbon, right here, I have two bonds to oxygen. One, two. And these are OR groups, O carbon, O carbon. So I have an acetal. 
This is just a scarier looking version of your Orgo Beast protecting group. And what we saw with Orgo Beast was if you had Orgo Beast and you wanted to remove your protecting group, turn it back into a carbonyl, or rather going forward with H plus and a diol, you can put, sorry, so the way we make Orgo Beast is by taking a diol an H plus and reacting it with a double bond O. To go backwards, we have found our Orgo Beast and we see that if we use this as our template, the carbon that has the two OR groups on it is the carbon that should have the double bond O in it from the reactant. And the two oxygens that are in the ring are their own OHs separate from that double bond O. To translate that into this question, what we need to do is, what I recommend first, just redraw everything exactly the same. Redraw this whole thing the same way on your reactant side so you can just erase bonds and add bonds and make things easier for you. So we have methyl there, methyl there, we've got this connecting to the oxygen, and that. Okay, now what we're going to do, as we saw with our example, is first find your acetal carbon. Namely the carbon that has the two oxygens bonded to it. That carbon right there. And on that carbon, what you're going to do is you're going to erase all the bonds that connect the oxygen to that carbon. I'm going to erase this bond, and I'm going to erase this bond. On the carbon that we said is our acetal carbon, that's where your double bond O should go. So put a double bond O there, and we saw that the two oxygens that used to be part of the ring became OHs. So this becomes an OH, and this becomes an OH, and there is your reactant. So all you have to do here is erase the two bonds that connect the oxygens to the same carbon, make those oxygens of the ring OHs, and put a double bond O on the carbon they used to be attached to. Let's do the same process for number four. In number four, what we see is we have, again, an acetal carbon. This carbon is connected to one oxygen carbon, one oxygen carbon. Even if it's wedges or dashes, those are still just carbon, those are still just bonds. So it may look scarier, but it's still the same exact idea. So if I want to figure out what this looked like as a reactant, once again, I'm going to redraw everything exactly the same. Okay. Next, I'm going to erase the bonds that connect those two oxygens to the same carbon. The oxygens that used to be connected to that carbon will become OHs and the carbon that they were connected to will get a double bond O. And there's my product. If I want to draw this out neater, I just need to number carbons and figure out where they belong. So let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So I'm gonna draw a nine carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. On carbon five, one, two, three, four, five, there should be a double bond O. And on carbon nine and one, there should be an OH. So this is what it would look like if I drew it out all linear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay? So that's how you approach these kind of reverse engineering orbital beast questions. Find your acetal carbon, erase the bonds that connect it to the two oxygens, put a double bond O on that acetal carbon, and make the two oxygens that used to be there OHs. And now number five. Number five was meant to be a more challenging problem because um, it's just a matter of visualizing. It's hard to visualize these kind of questions unless you draw things out. So let's erase this so I have space. Let's redraw this structure from number five. So we are told that in number five, what we're trying to do is make two different hemiacetals through an intramolecular reaction. And all intramolecular means is typically forming a ring or inter the molecule interacting with itself. In most cases, especially for hemiacetal formation, that usually involves the formation of a ring. But let's see how that happens. Okay. So we have H+. And as we saw before, in the formation of any acetal or hemiacetal, we need acidic conditions. And the first step is just the double bond O grabs that proton. And so what we'll get is, I'm going to be lazy and just redraw it here, you get double bond OH positive. The next step of a hemiacetal formation is some HOR group attacks the double bond O at its base. 
And here's the point. We have two different OHs that could do that very attack. And that's where your two different products come from. In one scenario, let's say it's the OH on the left that attacks. This comes in and attacks here, and that resonates up. Well, let's figure out how large that ring is going to be. Since the oxygen is doing the attack, I'm going to count that as one of my members of the ring. One, two, three, four, five. This is where the oxygen is attacking, so I'm tying number one to number five. I am making a five-membered ring. So I'm going to start by just drawing a five-membered ring. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? And I'm going to arbitrarily number these carbon or these carbons one through five, because I know it's a five-membered ring. Now I'm just going to fill in the blanks based on how these numbers were written out initially. Number one was an OH, which means number one is actually an oxygen, not a carbon. And it came in with its hydrogen, so it's OH positive. Carbon two had a methyl. Carbon three had two methyls. Carbon four had nothing, and carbon five had the, the oxygen bond that got attacked. It resonated up, so it's just an OH here. And then it had all of these carbons. One, two, three, one, two, three, OH, and methyl. Okay? And then the last step we know is this always gets deprotonated. They asked for a hemiacetal product, which means we just need this where it's deprotonated. A hemiacetal, again, is a carbon with one OH and one OR. Here we are. So this is one possible product. Now let's consider the other product, where instead of the OH on the left, the OH on the right attacked, meaning one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to make another five-membered ring, but the way it's connected will look different because this wasn't part of the ring. So number one comes in and attack number five. This resonates up. And I'll number these in a different color so it's easier to keep track of them. I'll number these one, two, three, four, five. So the red numbers are going to be my other product. So once again, I know I'm making a five-membered ring, so I'm going to just start with that. One, two, or let me make sure I have this. Uh, so uh, one, two, three, four, five. Once again, let's say that this is carbon one, two, three, four, five. So in this case, once again, number one was an oxygen, which came with its hydrogen, so it's OH positive. And then on number two, we had nothing special. Number three, we have a methyl. Number four, we have nothing special. And number five, once again, we have the carbon that had the oxygen that got attacked. So that moved up and became an OH neutral. And on the carbon 5, we have all of these. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'll match these up with blue. Here's carbon red. Here's carbon blue 4, 3, 2, and I number the OH one. So this is an OH. Carbon number 3 had two methyls. Carbon number 2 had one methyl. And so here are the two possible products you could form from this, this hemiacetal formation. Again, don't forget to deprotonate and make it neutral. But these would be your two answers for number five. Number five is a more challenging question from the rest. It's more mechanism driven, it's more theory driven. The point to take away from this is whenever you see something talking about intramolecular hemiacetal formation, all you're gonna have happen is one of the OHs in that molecule will attack a double bond O and most likely form a ring. Okay? And so there we go. There, these are some good common questions you'll see on exams very often.